Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Mentor with Ron Squires, who's going to talk today about how to make sure that a 5G chip will actually work before it's built. Ron, 5G is a completely new technology. It's built upon, theoretically, 4G, but the chips are different. What changes in terms of what do you have to think about now that you didn't think about before with 5, 4G? Well, 5G is a, a radical departure from 4G in the sense that uh, the, uh, the radio has now um, increased significantly in the bandwidth and spectral efficiency that it can supply uh, in terms of massive MIMO and projected out into the future with millimeter wave. So we're seeing the uh, front hall transport network and back hall networks having to scale uh, commensurately with that uh, increase in overall bandwidth uh, for 5G new radios. How are we going to make sure that these things actually work? What sort of issues are you seeing? Well, uh, a lot of these systems are being developed, being developed uh, along with draft standards that are changing quite frequently. Uh, we need to be able to uh, adjust these designs uh, pre-silicon and verify them in a, a very efficient manner. And to do that, you need more than just a simple test bench infrastructure. You need an ecosystem of 5G components through both virtualization and potentially hardware hybridization into an emulation platform uh, to be able to sufficiently stress these devices with workloads that can adequately characterize the performance, latency, and throughput characteristics that are needed for these devices. Why don't you draw this out for us? Okay. So Ron, what are we looking at here? Uh, here we're looking at a uh, typical uh, front hall network for 5G where we have a core network followed by a baseband unit, potentially a radio aggregation unit, and then remote radio units that ultimately connect to antennas that radiate out to user equipment. Uh, what we want to do here pre-silicon is to verify all of these components in this 5G stack uh, in, in such a way that we have uh, a complete uh, validation of all the potential protocols that um, each of these components need to, need to support. And we need to be able to have a flexible uh, uh, verification platform that can act as each of these components to test the adjacent components in the network stack. What's different here versus a 4G chip? Well, the difference here within the 4G uh, ecosystem versus a 5G is that, again, the sheer massive volume of data coming back from the uh, 5G new radio has to be accommodated within the front hall network. To do that, you have to have advanced uh, networking capabilities. Actually, some of these capabilities are transitioning from the back hall domain into the front hall, like switching, aggregation, uh, to be able to dynamically and, flexibility, and flexibly reallocate uh, resources across the various radios in the CRAN ecosystem. And there's a lot of new pieces in here as well, right? Because you have things like an antenna array, a phased antenna array, which used to be a single wire in the past. You can't necessarily get that to test it, so now you have to verify it up front. That's exactly right. In fact, with, with uh, you know uh, radio technology advancing to much higher numerologies for massive MIMO and potentially millimeter wave in the future, uh, you've got all of these uh, test patterns or antenna patterns that uh, you need to develop uh, pre-silicon in order to test the hardware that will eventually mate up with those uh, antenna configurations and profiles. And so that's a big challenge and you need to have the models and virtualization in your verification infrastructure along with the emulation capability to run fast enough to be able to vet and test all those new um, antenna patterns that will eventually need, be needed. And there are really two sides of 5G too, right? There's a sub six gigahertz and then there's the uh, millimeter wave and everything up and in, into that, that space. Those are completely different worlds. Yes, truly they are. Uh, the worlds are different in the sense that for sub-6 gigahertz, we pretty much know how to do that fairly well. We've, we've done the transitions from 2G to 3G to 4G. We understand multi-RAT. We understand cooperative multi-path. 
and uh, you know, leveraging in uh, disparate technologies to be able to um, uh, provide the interoperability uh, within these multiple uh, uh, radio access technologies. And, uh, but what's new with sub-6 is obviously refarming some of the spectrum to be uh, 5G uh, to support you know, both uh, 5G assisted and then eventually 5G uh, unassisted uh, networks. But massive MIMO and millimeter wave uh, provide a completely new twist on um, how uh, 5G deployments and uh, developments will, will progress in the future. So 5G adds some significant problems that weren't there before, particularly when you get into the millimeter wave. There's no way to test some of this stuff is going to have to be over the air, uh, never been done before on a mass scale. How much of this can be front loaded so that you can verify and reduce your test time as opposed to figuring out on the test side if it's working or not and less on the verification side? Well, that's a really good point. Um, you know, part of the problem with these uh, advanced radio technologies is that there's a, there's a, there's a uh, hardware crunch, if you will, in the sense that you've got to scale up not only the test platforms uh, to do the, the, the analysis of these, of these signals, but you've got to have anechoic chambers, you've got to have a lot of infrastructure available to do these kinds of over-the-air testing. Uh, and the economies of scale just don't meet the, the, the demand for the proliferation of all these uh, RAN elements for the you know the, uh, the the disaggregation that's going on, so you really need to f have a wholesale new approach with things like virtualization, modeling, channel characterization, uh, ranging, fading, beam forming, uh, uh, RF scanning. You need these models in a virtual world uh, to be able to test. Uh, actual hardware that you're trying to develop and make sure it's architecturally correct. Okay, so we know what's broken here. How do we fix it? Well, uh, the way the best way Mentor has uh, addressed this issue is to basically come up with uh, a, ver a verification paradigm that allows uh, both pre-silicon and post-silicon test uh, such that test cases migrate seamlessly and with zero effort between these two domains. So for example, you could have a device under test, which would be, for example, the radio aggregation unit, which could be a switch for CIPRI or eCIPRI or any of the technologies that are listed here. And this is the component that you're interested in verifying, but you need a model to be able to stress this device in interesting ways. And so coming up with the virtualization and the modeling and the transactors to be able to adequately uh, verify this component is one of the key value adds in this new verification paradigm that's pre-silicon. Do we know all the corner cases that you will have to fix? Another great question. So uh, part, of the, part of the importance of the platform is to be able to act in the various roles that, the, that these components will ultimately play. For, so for example, if you, if you have a test platform that can act as an actor or a sniffer or an intruder, in the intruder mode, you can certainly inject delays or the error cases that are interesting from an architectural level, or even the negative testing necessary to be able to stress test the design when conditions occur out of bounds. What you're talking about really is breaking down some of the barriers between what previously existed in verification, right? So now you have to think about front end, back end more holistically than you did in the past with 5G. Well, I know it's an overused term, but, but we talk about this shift left concept that mentor a great deal. And what we're talking about is being able to pull in the same ecosystem for software and hardware that's traditionally been run in prototyping and on the lab uh, uh, on the bench, pulling that into pre-silicon and being able to run all the applications and workloads at the core level uh, to be able to stress the devices just like they would be stressed on the bench. Only doing it pre-silicon now and saving millions of dollars in the process in terms of you know, fab outs and, and trials being, having to be redone and even deployments failing. How much of this gets fed back in 
uh, sort of a closed loop type of system post silicon. So can you take some of the data that you pull out of there and say, oh, this needs to go back further into the the uh, um, verification cycle because we found some problems here that we didn't expect? Well, uh, it, that's interesting because that's one of the key values that pops out of all of this when you're able to migrate tests between pre-silicon and post-silicon so easily because now when you detect a problem in the field and you're able to reproduce that issue in the laboratory, you can immediately pull that into an emulation environment where you have 100% visibility, 100% fidelity, and you can be solving problems in a matter of hours instead of days uh, that you would normally experience on the bench or even in the field. You've listed a lot of protocols there. Um, as a result of that, do you need more cycles than what you had in the past to test these chips? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the state, the, the state space is exploding uh, for 5G in terms of verification. And you need, you need the verification tools that have been traditionally offered in a pre-silicon environment to keep track of that. Um, you know, things like coverage and power and peak power, average power, and how software relates to the power profile and the power intent of the design. Um, all of these, pro, all, all of these pro protocols can, can exist in various implementations depending on vendor, supplier, uh, uh, carrier selections, even geographies uh, have an influence on what kind of uh, implementations uh, take hold in a given 5G ecosystem. Typically verification has been all about functionality. Is there more to it now than what was there in the past? Is it just functionality or is it now What's the speed here? How fast is it move? How fast is data moving through here? Uh, is there a, a handoff when you go from a, a area where you have five uh, G millimeter wave to four G LTE or even three G? Right. So, uh, so one of the uh, one of the benefits of having a a much broader ecosystem with virtualized components is that you are able to bring in these disparate technologies to you know focus on multi rat. Uh, focus on the cooperative multipath and uh, network slicing is a perfect example where you can't test that with existing 4G networks today and it's going to be a big component in 5G networks but there's no hardware out there yet to really validate it on the bench. So how do you know your software applications and your orchestration software is doing is going to do the right thing with regard to, to flexi in, in some cases or software defined networking in other cases. Uh, so you really need to be able to pull these things in uh, to a, a more comprehensive ecosystem to be able to test those higher level functions. One of the big issues in these designs is power. Power is the gating factor in almost everything we're doing, and it's even more so when we start getting into uh, um, wireless. How do you verify this? What happens on the verification cycle? Right. So. For things like massive MIMO and millimeter wave, those are going to be high power uh, modes of operation. Uh, we have to uh, basically grapple with uh, new power footprints in an intelligent way. And not only that, uh, because of the various splits that ORAN provides in terms of how functionality is uh, allocated across the, uh, the stack, uh, power can actually move dynamically depending on the application. So you can imagine, for example, a mech design where you have uh, a multi-axis edge compute where perhaps much of the baseband uh, functionality is more local to the radio than might be otherwise allocated for uh, a general purpose installation. For that mode, you'd be, uh, you'd be, have, you'd be having a much higher power profile than you would for uh, maybe a standard uh, radio unit. So being able to measure and analyze power pre-silicon becomes almost a de facto must-have. And in order to do that, you need to be able to couple state-of-the-art power tools into the emulation platform. You need to be able to run the real workloads that generate those profiles, and you need to be able to run the right software in order to excite the hardware to generate those profiles. So basically what we need here is really domain knowledge that we didn't need necessarily in the past for a standard chip going into a socket, right? That's right. I mean, and everything's changing. So, you know, packaging is changing. Uh, processor architectures are changing. You're getting AI now introduced into these chips to do channel estimation and, um, you know, other high-level decision-making for, uh, uh, you know, self-organizing networks 
within 5G. And you're going to find more and more uh, software over time migrating to hardware elements to be able to make that go fast. Ron Squires, thanks for a really interesting explanation of what's happening. Thank you.